Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to our Health Innovation Seminar entitled, Is Sitting the New Smoking? My name is Cindy Yell, and I have the privilege and honor of serving as President and CEO of the Toronto Rehab Foundation right here at the University Health Network. Before we get started, I should tell you where we're, we're beaming to you from. Uh, we are actually in a studio uh, at the Toronto General Hospital at the corner of University and College. And what people may not appreciate if you're in Toronto or I think we have people from all over the country today actually uh, beaming in or tuning into us. Um, this little stretch uh, of less than a mile along University Avenue uh, between Dundas to the south and uh, Bloor Street to the north is home to one of the largest and most significant scientific research hubs dedicated to healthcare in the world. And so um, it's an extraordinary place and, and Toronto Rehab is uh, certainly a central part of it. So our health innovation uh, webinar today, and we run health innovation seminars live with people in the, actually live in the audience. And um, we've been doing them for a number of years now. And I'm pleased to let you know that we have the sponsor of all these seminars and webinars here with us today. His name is uh, Mr. Bob Blakely, and he's sitting just over here. I'm not sure if we're gonna get, get a shot of him, but um, Bob has been chair of the board of the Toronto Rehab Foundation uh, for the past two years, and has actually been involved with our organization for coming up on a decade. And um, over the course of his leadership and his involvement, our organization has soared. And on that note, uh, many people don't know, uh, Toronto Rehab, our research institute, has recently been recognized as being number one, the leader uh, in the world. And so I often say there aren't many organizations in Toronto, there aren't many organizations in Canada actually, that can claim number one status. But right here at Toronto Rehab, we can, and we take enormous pride in it. So I'm going to make a couple shout outs. We have a lot of people uh, that have joined us today and we're thrilled that this is growing and that you're interested uh, in hearing uh, some of our prevention tips uh, that we give out to the community. Uh, shout outs and you're welcome to cheer wherever you're, wherever you're sitting or standing right now. You should be standing. Um, shout out to BMO, TD Bank, Scotiabank, Sun Life, Medivy Blue Cross, Torque and Mains I understand has a big crowd with us today. Uh, 19 lawyers, uh, UHN Toronto Rehab. I believe um, all of our Toronto Rehab sites uh, have actually, and we have five of them uh, across the city, um, are joining us today. And, and so we're um, so thrilled that you're here. And um, a shout out to all of our Toronto Rehab colleagues. Uh, it's a privilege for all of us at the foundation to work with you. And we know that through your work, you change lives, not just for the patients, uh, but the families uh, that surround and embrace them as well. So as I mentioned, today's uh, seminar, webinar, uh, is called, Is Sitting the New Smoking? And um, there's a lot of research uh, that's actually been taking place at Toronto Rehab, trying to understand uh, what are the key prevention aspects, key prevention tools and things that one can do to ensure that they live a long, healthy and productive life. And um, one of our rock star scientists, and I use that term because um, I believe it, I embrace it, uh, one of our rock star scientists is here with us today, and his name is Dr. David Altern. And uh, let me introduce him to you. He's, he's going to join me uh, on screen in a moment. Uh, David has been with Toronto Rehab UHN for many years now. He's a senior scientist in our research institute. Uh, he also holds the chair in cardiac uh, prevention, rehabilitation and prevention, and it's uh, funded by Toronto Rehab Foundation. He's a professor at the University of Toronto. He has over 175 published papers, research papers, peer reviewed. Um, and he's really having uh, a lot of attention placed on him and, and the research that he recently conducted over the past year. And it's related to not just walking, but the, the standing aspect. Is standing something that can really uh, help one, again, improve their, their life, uh, improve their health and well-being? So I think, I think that's it for me right now. Um, I'm going to come back a little bit on format. I'm going to slip through the slides here. Oh, look, introducing me. <laughs> I'm a little behind. Um, just so, as I slide through the slides, uh, just so you know, we are going to have this webinar uh, posted on YouTube over the next couple of days. So you're welcome to uh, view it again or share it with uh, friends and colleagues as you see fit. Um, we will be welcoming questions. It is intended to be interactive today. We're going to wait till after uh, David's uh, finished, Dr. Alters finished his presentation. But we encourage you to type in your answers, uh, to send them to trf at uhn.ca. So that's trf at uhn.ca. All right, and so we'll get to your questions uh, a little bit later. But on 
at this point, I'm going to welcome David Alter. Thank you. Hi, Thanks, David. Debbie. Thanks, Thanks so, so much. much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here and uh, a, a real privilege to be part of this institution and what we're doing. Let me begin by saying that as hunters and gatherers, we were once a very agile, highly mobile population. And uh, as evolution and technology has progressed, uh, our physical activity patterns have regressed. Uh, we're now uh, highly immobile, um, uh, stationary, and lazy. And uh, this disease that we call sedentary behavior afflicts nearly two-thirds of the population. Now, some have said that sitting is the new smoking. Is that really true? And if so, what can we do about it? So today, we're going to examine the myths and realities around sedentary behavior, and we're going to examine some simple, pragmatic ways to sever the cultural norm of physical inactivity. So with that, please join me, and I think I'm going to stand for this one. <laughs> okay. So let's begin with what we know about physical inactivity and evolution. Back in the day, uh, before any of us in this room or otherwise were born, um, most of our exercise activities amounted to about a thousand per day energy expenditure burn. We would spend thousand calories per day exercising, hunting and gathering. Now, we expend about 300 calories per day in exercise. Now, before we get into sitting, I want to talk about what the benefits of physical activity are to our health. We have known that physical activity actually improves our survival and health, not just for cardiac disease, but for a host of conditions, from diabetes uh, to stroke uh, to uh, lung disease, through gastrointestinal diseases, musculoskeletal problems, mental health issues, depression, anxiety, a host of chronic conditions for which physical activity is a treatment, and a treatment that actually saves lives among all of those conditions. And so we've coined this idea that physical activity is really an exercise pill. It's a non-pharmacological pill with a dose and the way of administering this pill. Um, and indeed, for every 10% increase in the population who consume this exercise pill, we know that we have about a 0.25 year extension in our life expectancy and about $200, 200 million dollars of savings in healthcare expenditures. So this is a pretty important pill that we need to promote to doing such a good uh, improvement to our health. Our guidelines now advocate that adults age 18 to 64 consume about 150 to 300 minutes of this exercise pill. And we're going to discuss this more as the talk proceeds. Okay, let's flip the coin over to sitting. What about sitting? Over the last two decades, we've gotten and accumulated a host of evidence that says sitting is really bad for us, not just for heart disease, but for cancer and a whole host of conditions. But the question is, is sitting just the opposite of not exercising? Are they really just examining two extremes of the same condition? Those of us who sit more exercise less. So the question is, is, ex is sitting an, an, an independent uh, determinant of our health and survival irrespective of whether we exercise or not. So this was a focus of our research uh, about two years ago, in which we examined whether sitting alone actually portends a poorer health, irrespective of how much physical activity we do. And, uh, and what we determined indeed was that um, sitting is actually an important determinant of our health, irrespective of exercise. For example, sitting portends about a two-fold higher risk of diabetes, but a 14% higher risk of heart disease, of cancer, and about a 24% higher risk of all-cause mortality or death rates, irrespective of whether we're actually exercising or not. But here's the kicker. 
Sitting is bad regardless of exercise, but sitting is really bad if we don't exercise at all. So if we actually split and examine those people who did fulfill their minimal exercise guideline targets versus those that did not, let's see what we get. For those that don't reach their 30 minutes of exercise per day and who sit for long, prolonged periods of time during the day, we find that the risk of death is about 46% higher than those who don't sit. Conversely, those of us who are actually exercising to our targets 30 minutes per day, but who also happen to be sitting a lot, the mortality or death rates are only 14 to 16 percent higher than those that actually do not sit for prolonged periods of time. So the bottom line is sitting is bad regardless of exercise, but sitting is much, much worse if we don't exercise at all. And I'm going to return to that very, very important concept towards the end of the talk. So I get often asked, well, how much sitting is too much? And this follow-up paper that was done by, by, uh, by a group in the United States, they actually quantified in hourly and minute term how much sitting is too much. And they determined that anything more than 12 hours per day of a sitting, uh, of, an, of a wake hours per day is really bad for our health. But actually, sitting bouts are also bad as little as 10 minutes at a time or more of sitting at one place at one time actually begins to actually portend a poorer health so it's not just about how much sitting we're doing through the day it's the bout duration of sitting that we're doing at any one time that seems to be important so why is sitting bad for our health? What is it doing to our insides that's making us have a higher risk of heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and death? The answer lies in something that we've termed, uh, that the research community has termed metabolic toxicity. It's a fancy term which I'm going to explain in a second. First of all, when we do not move and we're sitting, our muscle activity is actually not firing at all. Our muscle fibers are actually completely dormant. And that's one of the reasons, in fact, that after we've been sitting for a while and we stand, we get achy. It's because our muscles haven't been actually fibering, uh, firing at, uh, at the rate that it should be. But that's only one piece of the puzzle. What actually happens is if we look at people who sit through the day versus those who are standing just in the afternoon, we find that our sugar metabolism, our ability to actually metabolize glucose, is actually 40% lower in those that stand as opposed to those that actually sit. So there's something about our, our, the way we utilize our sugar and carbohydrates in our body that actually is connected to this sitting time disease. And this increased glucose, this increased glucose turns to fat. When we don't use the energy that we need to hunt or to gather or to do whatever physical activity we need, that extra, that extra calories turns to fat. It's actually an adaptive process. We store fat so that we can use it later. The problem is, if we store too much fat and don't use enough of it later, fat can cause disease. And it can cause not just a host of variety of different diseases, brain and our immune system and our muscles, but in fact when we look at arteries that are clean and we see what happens when we develop disease, hardening of the arteries, this is what it looks like. It is fat filled, it is crusty, and it is ugly. This indeed is part of the syndrome of metabolic toxicity. Too much energy, not enough energy burn, leads to fat accumulation because we're not using what we need. That fat storage turns to disease. That disease manifests itself into hardening of the arteries and other fat-related illnesses. So the question is, is sitting really as bad as smoking? No way. Let's look at the evidence a little bit differently. Smoking has been shown to actually decrease life expectancy by as much as 10 years. Sitting, on the other hand, 
can reduce life expectancy by about three years. So clearly, smoking is much worse than sitting. So where did all this mythology come from that sitting is the new smoking? Well, it comes from this. More people sit than smoke. And if we look at how much people smoke, it's about 15 to 25 percent of the population smoke, and that's actually been falling and then rising again. But physical inactivity affects about 75 to 85 percent of the population. So when we do the numbers, while sitting is not as bad as smoking, when we look at how many people are sitting and for how long, it accumulates over the population. And this has given rise to one of the new crises that we've had to deal with, which is called the obesity epidemic. And over the last 20 years, in fact, in many jurisdictions in westernized society, we're seeing about a 60, 60% relative increase in obesity. So is sitting the new smoking? Well, not really, not at an individual basis. I'd rather my patients sit than smoke. However, when you tabulate what is the burden of sitting to the population, the strides that we have made at improving life expectancy by decreasing smoking is going to be counteracted and surpassed, unfortunately, by the rise in obesity over the next 20 to 30 years. This is what the physical inactivity crisis is. It affects 65 to 85 percent of the population and it is considered one of the biggest public health challenges of our time called the no-do gap. So, what do we do about this? How do we reverse these cultural norms of sitting and lack of physical activity? Well, the old adage, sit less, move more, is, is what we hear all the time. And these are the simple pearls that we often hear that are often easier said than done. For example, we hear things like, well, leave your car at home and take public transport and walk. Uh, uh, use, use the escalator as opposed to the elevator, standing brakes, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, get away from the couch, do household chores. Uh, my favorite is one I came up with um, a, a few years ago. You know, every half an hour watching commercials, take up and do your two minute break. But the truth of the matter is that when we look at these simple pearls, they're kind of intuitive. They're kind of boring and as many patients have told me, Alter, these are kind of duh, like, you know, there's nothing magical about what you're telling me. Problem is that some people hear this message in very different ways than what we think we, we communicate them to. For example, to stay young, the doctor said to exercise and eat the right foods. What? I thought he said accessorize and buy, buy the nice shoes. So, Sometimes the message gets lost in translation because we just don't communicate in a way that we're receptive uh, in the same words. Uh, other times, we don't really want to hear the message. We're not responsive. Leave me alone. I'm exercising already. And then sometimes we just don't message the message quite well enough, as would be seen in this example. Uh, my eyes are bad, but uh, uh, what fits your busy schedule better, uh, exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? God forbid, if I ever said that to a patient, I'd be reported. So our messaging seems to be what's at play. It's our responsiveness to the message, it's how we interpret the message, and it's how we message. So yeah, sit less, stand more is the goal, but it's not the message. So we need to re-message the message, and that's what the rest of this presentation is going to be about. So now, it would be easiest to say, okay, as a solution, let's just actually re-engineer society. Take away cars, make it all walkable, walkability and change our urban environments is clearly a very important tool to be had to change our sitting time behaviors, which by no, reason, which by no uh, surprise is the reason why, for example, 
Western Canada and BC have far lower heart disease rates than Eastern Canada. Canada. The lifestyle, the urban planning is very, very important around our, uh, to sever and to break those cultural norms. But failing that, because you and I are not often in the power to re-regulate and re-engineer urban society, it falls unfortunately upon ourselves to re-engineer ourselves. So one important way is to look at our 24-hour day and to find a way to re-engineer our time. So for example, if we spend nine and a half hours sitting, the goal here, and, and only 30 minutes, uh, or 0.3 minutes in this, uh, 0.3 hours in this example, or four hours doing some sort of activity, the idea here is how do we take that nine and a half hours of sitting and actually shift time reallocate our schedule such that we actually do more physical activity than less. Okay, this comes down to the notion of quantifying, counting. What are we to count to actually re-engineer our time schedule? Let's look at this a little bit more carefully. There are two elements to our physical activity that we need to count. One is our intensity, for example, what's our pace of exercise? How fast do we walk? Do we not walk and just stand? The other is, how many minutes do we do that? That's it. Two simple measures. How fast and how long. So let's look at intensity first. The magic, magic word that is a key message to come away from, from today's seminar is something called the metabolic equivalent task or the MET. I will be referring to this the MET repeatedly in the next few minutes. The MET is the magic number of intensity. It is a number that defines our fitness level and how many calories we are burning per hour. The MET is the intensity unit that we will be talking about. One MET which is what many of the people in this room, unfortunately, are still sitting at, they are at rest. They are burning about one calorie per kilogram per hour. That is our resting metabolic rate. That is one met. Anything over that is some sort of physical activity. So, resting is one met. For the average 70 kilogram individual, it's about 70 calorie burn per hour. Standing is about 2.3 mets, which is about 160 calories per hour of a burn. Walking is about 3 mets, about 210 calories per hour we burn. Jogging is about 6.3 mets, which is about 378 calories per hour we burn. So if we do a weighted average, a complicated statistic, and take every hour of our day, some of which is sleeping, some of which is waking, we tally this all up, we don't want to be at the one met level. We want to average, this weighted average, to be a target of 1.75, which is what our ancestors were back in the day. The magic number of mets per week that we need to accumulate based on the scientific proof that has shown that our mortality is reduced, our disease is actually reduced, is 750 met minutes per week or more. That is the magic combination of the MET, which is the intensity level, and the minutes. And we can get to 750 MET minutes in a variety of ways. If we stand, if we walk a little bit, or if we walk a lot, the number of minutes will be reflective in that calculation. It's a simple multiplication by METs by the number of minutes per week. That is the magic number that we need to get to to actually regress these cultural norms. Okay, how can we do it? Well, let's go back to reshifting our time around. If we go from sitting to, say, a light activity like standing, and we allocate two hours per day of our sitting to light activity like standing, in my example, every 30 minutes, take a two-minute break of walking or standing, throughout the day that can accumulate over time of about two hours. What we're doing there is reallocating our MET from 1, which is our resting state, to 2.3, which is our standing state. That's an extra 180 calories burned per day over the course of a 12-hour day. 
That is an extra 65,700 calories burned per year. So simply taking two hours of your day and going from the sitting position to the standing position can burn 65,000 calories per year. That's equivalent to 250 Big Macs. That's a lot of Big Macs just from moving ourselves from the sitting position to the standing position. That could be a cure and a Logan for many fast food outlets, but I won't name any of them. I'm not sure if any of them are sponsors here today, but it is a take home message for all of us. This is where the world has gone in terms of, well then let's just shift our workplace from the sitting position to the standing position. This is where standing workstations have come from. The idea that we can burn much more of our calories standing than sitting. And the projected, actually, increment to our health is huge. Studies have shown, for example, that two to three hours per day of a standing workstation could result in as much as a 20 to 30 kilogram weight loss over a year. That's, of course, if they don't consume 250 Big Macs to make up for that standing. So in theory, in theory, the standing workstation is a solution to the sitting time crisis. But the problem is this. When we look at standing workstations, we see that actually it is very effective. People do sit less. But we find over time that they may not necessarily be healthier. Now standing can result in a lot of other untoward consequences. Varicose veins as we get older, blood pooling, back problems. So yes, it's not for everybody, but even there, we're not moving, we're standing. So the question is, is standing enough? Well, standing can get us out of sitting, and standing can burn more calories, but does it really get us healthier? The answer so far would suggest maybe not. So, standing does not appear to be enough. I always, for those of, uh, of, of you who might be watching today and patients, I always use the rabbit and turtle analogy. We all remember the rabbit and turtle analogy. You know, you've got the race, and the rabbit speeds ahead and says, there's so much further ahead than the turtle, so I'm just going to take a rest. And over time, the turtle surpasses the rabbit and actually reaches the finish line first. You know, the idea that we have to move, not just stand, is a very important concept to reaching a goal, especially a goal of 750 minutes per week. So standing may not be the solution, but movement might. So what happens if instead of sitting, we shift our time from sitting, not to standing, but sitting to some sort of movement activity? What can be achieved? Let's go back to our 24-hour day. We take two hours of sitting to standing and we burn that 255 Big Macs over a year. Conversely, if we took 30 minutes of our day and did exercise, we would burn the same number of calories as we would for two hours a day standing. But we would be doing something more than just standing. We would be moving. So who would rather take 30 minutes of their time and move or two hours of their time to stand. If we burn the same number of calories, does it really make a difference? Well, let's see which one wins out. The notion that we need some sort of activity is really important. The MET is really important. The MET is our intensity level, it is our fitness, and our caloric expenditure. When we look at an ability to track the MET, there are all sorts of publicly accessible tools, and I will make sure that Cindy actually, uh, actually um, puts this on, on the website to make sure that everybody has access to what the physical activity compendium is. But it is an encyclopedia that allocates a MET to every single, every single activity we would ever conceive of, including a marching band, how many Mets are in a drummer if you're a, 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 a musician versus 
uh, a sax player or a piano player, in which case you're going to be sitting more time. You have this wonderful guide that can actually give you the MET that you need. And the MET matters. Why does the MET matter? Well, on the horizontal axis, you see METs. That's our fitness level, going from more than 6 to 12. And on the vertical axis is our death rates per 10,000 person years. Look at that curve. As we achieve more METs, we actually live longer. So a moderate MET level of about 6, which is a brisk pace to a slow jog, can actually achieve uh, a much better mortality uh, curve than somebody sitting. Somebody actually running uh, or doing high level METs can actually achieve uh, even more bang for their buck in terms of lives years saved. But where, where we get caught is this notion of low level intensity of activity. When you're at the low METs level, your mortality can actually shoot up the roof. So the idea here that we at least need some level of movement to get that curve, to get that health curve better, to get that death rates lower is very, very important. And it's important because of this. The more METs we can achieve, the better fitness we can achieve. Now fitness is a physiologic measure. It is how much oxygen is extracted from our hemoglobin, which is the little transport cars in our bloodstream that transfer oxygen to each of our, ve each of our vessels and tissues in our body. The fitter we are, the more avidly oxygen is taken up from the hemoglobin into our tissues. The less fit we are, the more our body relies on organs like the heart to pump that oxygen through to our organs. And that stress level on the heart ain't that healthy for our body. That sheer stress that goes through our blood vessels ain't that healthy. So the idea that fitness is important is because it is an adaptive process to make us more efficient in using oxygen. And we've seen that the fitter we are, the more METs we achieve, the more calories we burn through higher fitness levels, the less plaque we have in our arteries. That is not a coincidence. That is sheer physiology. So let's return to that science point that I made earlier. The health determinants of sitting are mostly th there among those who do not exercise. Among avid exercisers, the bad effects of sitting are actually quite marginal. So if you do have to sit, Make sure you at least get your 30 minutes of exercise per day. That is, that is the key. It may not completely reverse the, the likelihood of sitting having adverse effects on you, but it certainly will help and lower that risk substantially to near zero. So in summary, sedentary behavior is a cultural norm. We've gotten here over two, several thousands and thousands and millions of years from a highly avid uh, uh, humanity to ones that are highly sedentary. And that has been as a result of technology and our cultural, culture. And it's very hard to sever cultural norms. Changing culture is really tough. Everybody here, I would presume, at least most people, would rather be the picture on the left than the picture on the right. We all recognize this visual imagery of health. Yet, in reality, they can be one in the same. So just because we lose weight and just because we aim for that one-time goal does not necessarily going to reverse the trends of our cultural norms, which are always going to get us back to the chair. That is what we are fighting as a society. So the solution comes into tracking our physical activity patterns. Movement is the key. We need a minimum of 750 met minutes per week, which is sort of correlated, which is sort of similar to about 150 minutes or more per week of moderate to vigorous exercise. That is the key. We need to accumulate this on your own schedules. I don't mind if, it, if you are a weekend warrior and you can't adapt yourself during the week to do physical activity, get your 150 minutes a week during the weekend. 
Uh, if, on the other hand, you have 10-minute spurts throughout the day, use those 10-minute spurts because they all count. 150 minutes per week can be accumulated in a lot of different ways. I love apps. Apps can help us track, but you don't need apps to do this. Simple diaries of tracking minutes per week as a log can be equally effective. The objective here is to count. Just like in Weight Watchers, one of the central themes as to why they have worked is to count the calories we take in. Well, this is the Weight Watchers equivalent to physical inactivity. Count the calories we do out. The calories we do out can be measured by moderate to vigorous exercise in minutes per week. And how you accumulate it is up to you. One of the initiatives that we are doing in conjunction with Toronto Rehab and, uh, and uh, Milton uh, Halton Parks and Recreation is to set up exercise clinics to help people learn how to do this very simple thing of tracking their met minutes per week. And I think that this will be the key to the future, is to actually take the mundane message of walking more, going up the escalator, and actually making it so trackable that it's front and top of mind. So the key message is, in conclusion, is sitting is bad for our health, but mostly bad for those who do not exercise. The mechanisms of disease uh, is complex, but it likely relates to metabolic toxicity. What happens when we use excess calories and we store them and we can't burn them? They move to fat and fat moves to disease. I would rather have my patients sit than smoke. But if they're to sit, make sure they're, they're exercising at least 150 minutes per week. Because it's far easier to find 150 minutes per week than to transform our physical activity patterns than to find 12 hours per day to transform our culture. With that, thank you very much. That looks good. It's a six hour special on how society is becoming too sedentary. All they would have to do is track their physical activity minutes and they would be standing at this time. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here today and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, so I'm coming back. Are we gonna sit or are we gonna stand? We're gonna stand. Are we going to stand? We're gonna stand. I'm so much taller than you did. Yes, you are. <laughs> okay, so uh, we did receive, uh, I think my mic's back on, yes. Um, that was great. Thank you. That was great. I have, personally have a few questions uh, of you, and I know um, that there are questions coming in from uh, the audience uh, out there, wherever you are, uh, keep them coming in. Um, I'm going to put my glasses on because I'm going to ask you to hold this, actually. Okay. Um, because, like you, my eyes don't work so well no anymore. Worries. So sad. Can you fix my eyes for me? I can't, but my eyes will be as bad as uh. yours and it's coming now, actually. Okay, so, so. so listen to this. So uh, you talked a lot about living a uh, longer life, uh, sitting uh, versus standing, smoking, exercise, 750 mets per week, all really cool stuff. One thing you didn't mention was that exercise just makes you feel awesome. And so, um, you know, it's, yeah, I think it's about taking that first step, right? Like, no pun intended, but taking that first step to exercise um, and, uh, you know, having a little bit of success, and success becomes the motivator, for sure, in terms of feeling good, maybe getting a little bit more fit, if one chooses to do so, losing a little bit of weight. So um, can you talk a little bit about kind of the endorphins and what happens when one exercises? Right. Yeah. Um, so... It's very true that physiologically, um, the act of movement with an increased heart response, with the actual pushing of our, of our respiratory system to actually gain a little bit of traction when we're moving, actually does a host of very complicated uh, but very uh, compelling physiologic aspects to our body. So we've talked a little bit about just the idea of fitness, of how oxygen is consumed more efficiently in our tissues. That's a big one. Because if we had a magic pill that could actually consume oxygen, then the stiffness in our body, the more effective our organs would be, would be far greater. And that, by the way, is why some elite athletes use erythropoietin as an aside. It actually increases the hemoglobin to make us more avid in extracting oxygen. So exercise does this for us. So that's one of the key aspects. Yes, exercise 
that aspect of fitness, that aspect of movement is critical for a whole bunch of neurohumoral regulatory aspects to our brain function. We've known that cognitive people, cognitive ability, our ability to learn, our ability to memorize, our attentiveness is all increased when we're exercising. It's no coincidence that exercise actually is a cancer treatment because it is actually an immune regulator. It's not just about that vessel that actually changes our immune response. So the idea that exercise can be a cure for sitting, but also a huge healthy pill and make us feel great is indeed the message. Great. So, you know, we've, um, we've done a number of these sessions, and, and one of the sessions we did, uh, I think it was uh, one, a live one with people in the audience uh, with us, uh, was on neurodegenerative diseases. And one of the uh, suggestions was that exercise can actually stave off uh, certain types of neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's and, and others, so uh, dementia. It was, it was pretty uh, profound, uh, that session. Um, I just want to remind people that if you have uh, questions, uh, the uh, site that you go to or the email that you send is uh, trf at uhn.ca. So we still have some time. There, there you go. go. <laughs> there it is. Um, so uh, the weekly MET cal calculator, I'm going to send out uh, information to everyone uh, that signed up uh, for sure on kind of the calculations. Is there actually a calculator, though, that we can send people? Yes. Um, so, uh, we, I mean, there are many calculators that create the MET. We're actually creating one and going to actually launch one live in the next two weeks. Fantastic. That we're going to be able to share with the world. Can, so we, uh, can we share it with the audience to, today, or is this? Uh, it'll probably be ready in about two weeks' time. Awesome. But it'll basically, you can actually type in anything you do, and it'll spill out your MET minutes per week. And that's going to be a very important tool. I think the objective here, though, is like it's not, as I say as a cardiologist, it's not brain surgery. Like it's just mm -hmm. the, idea, the idea that Ouch. actually simple, simple things, you said it right from the start. Simple, it's, it's about simple calculations. And just the idea that a slow walk is three mets and a standing is two mets and sitting is one met and a fast-paced walk is four mets. Like those are the ideas. It's the principles rather than kind of the number. If you don't want to know about the METs, if it's too complicated, just remember 150 right. minutes per week of exercise and you're good. Right. You know, in our office, uh, we don't have a, a big uh, staff complement, um, but in our office we actually have a couple of the standing workstations. And it's interesting uh, who's requested them or who's really keen on them. It's a little bit of the younger crowd. So maybe it's the folks that are sorry, David, you, like you and, and myself, that aren't so young that really needs, need to really uh, pick up on this message, right? So. Yeah, I, and I think, um, you know, culture will change. You know, it's not just about the standing workstations. What I think a key message is for the workplace is top of mind. What I do like about the standing workstations and the young crowd yes. um, is that it's becoming top of mind. It's about creating a new culture of health. Why are you having standing workstations? Because it's healthier. And I think there are many opportunities in the workplace to create healthier environments. So yes, while standing workstations may not be the cure of sitting, it's a change in culture. For sure. And that's awesome. And any, any place that can, can buy into that culture change, whether it's health engagement uh, initiatives in workplace settings, or whether it's an encouragement to standing breaks, that's all great because you're really actually making a huge impact into actually severing the cultural norm that has got us here over two million years. For sure. Um, I had uh, someone uh, just uh, email about, excuse me, I keep getting the questions are coming, um, about walking meetings. People are taking uh, walking meetings. So, uh, you know, I guess it depends on the type of meeting that you're having with a colleague or client or supplier or whatever. Uh, but they're doing walking meetings, which is kind of interesting. So I guess I, they didn't really say much, but um, they're going, I guess, to Tim's or Jimmy's or, you know, Starbucks with, with the person that they're meeting with, and they're having those conversations and moving, which is really great, right? Awesome. And those, and, <laughs> and those workplaces that encourage that, I think, is really it's part of actually just, just workplace engagement. I think it, it brings people together. There's so many benefits. It's kind of like you just asked me about, well, look at those endorphins with exercise. Yeah. 
bring that Isn't into that the workplace. Best? It's the best. It's it the best. Really, truly and is. you bring that into the workplace, and you're going to get those endorphins in the culture of the workplace as well. Yeah. So yes. We need to change the healthcare too, though the the um, the practitioners, the clinicians. Um, so um, I have here that uh, doctors are now prescribing exercise, which is kind of cool. So they're actually doing scripts for their patients, prescribing uh, exercise. Is that something that, you know, obviously you do it. Uh, colleagues, I, I guess uh, physicians, need to start thinking along that line a little bit more than, than perhaps they are today. Exactly, so one of the reasons why we created My Heart Fitness was to create exercise. What is that called again? My Heart Fitness, and it's, uh, it's uh, myheartfitness.ca is the website. These are clinics, these are exercise prescribing clinics coupled with other risk factor modification things that doctors and patients do. But it holds patients and doctors accountable for that interaction. Yeah. It's like if I'm gonna prescribe you your statin, I'm gonna prescribe you your exercise. You know, we do have to break it down for people. So it's like that lost messaging that I was saying. If we just say to people and give them a script, go exercise, live one hour of exercise or trade off 24 hours of life. Like the messaging is really important here. And so that's one of the key elements that as a team, we focus quite heavily on breaking down inactivity and, and, and really getting very specific in the prescribing of how we actually do things that should be intuitive to us. Right. You know, it's funny, like um, all these advances in technology, we have cars now, we have subways, we have computers, but really, we're missing the boat a little bit, right? All this technology that's supposed to help us live these wonderful lives and make things easier has really hurt us maybe a little bit. And so it's that adjustment back to the old ways uh, to a certain extent. So it's, yeah, it's not that complicated, is it? It's just making the choice. It's, it's not, making the choice. It's not that. And in any, in any sort of, without getting too complex and philosophical, but evolution is always about two steps forward, one step back. Right. So technology has, advance us, but there's been unintended consequences. The way we communicate and the way we actually move right. have been unintended consequences to technology innovation. Right. So I have a question. I'm not sure who this is from. It was anonymous. Uh, what is your recommendation for busy persons that, um, that don't have enough time for exercise? So what I, it's a great question. And, and, and as I sort of say to patients, what do you do uh, when you have to brush your teeth? and you don't have time? What do you do when you have to shower and you don't have time? You actually make time. It's a way we prioritize. And if I told you this pill is gonna make you live 25% longer or add two to three years of life expectancy, healthy life to you. Quality life, Quality right? of life with yeah. endorphins, with everything you've spoken about, <laughs> people would find the time. Yeah. It's not a lot of time investment, but it does take priority on how we allocate our time. And so some patients I have are really busy during the week. They fly, they're corporate, they move all around, there's no time. I say, okay, well, 10 minutes, give me 10 minutes before 8 a.m. and give me 10 minutes after 8 p.m. That's 20 minutes a day and give me a couple of workouts on the weekend. And lo and behold, they find their 150 minutes per week or very close to it. So it's not rocket science, it's just the prioritization of our time. That's great. Um, so we have like a really avid exerciser online with us right now. And um, they would like to ask you the question, please define quote unquote moderate. Great, great question. Um, so that is, um, so moderate exercise versus uh, intensive exercise is actually a bit subjective. Uh, here is what our rule of thumb is to quote unquote moderate exercise. Nobody really should be exercising to the point that they can no longer say a sentence as they're exercising. So if you're exercising and you go, what? You know, that's too vigorous for them. On the other hand, if you're able to sing opera while you're exercising, <laughs> that ain't enough. So moderate is somewhere in between that two And some of us can't extremes. sing opera ever, so. so. You know, in the shower though, <laughs> opera works for everybody. So the point being here is that it is a bit subjective. Um, there are ways in which we quantify kind of intensive and moderate. There's apps that do it. There's fitness tests to do it. So there are ways of doing it. Um, to give you a good uh, example, squash would be considered high intensive exercise. It's one of the most intensive. That's at about 13 mets, okay? Whereas standing, we said, was about two mets, and a brisk walk was about five mets. 
I would say a brisk walk would be considered moderate uh, for most people, but I would, you know, coming back to the message here, the message is the met is important. So don't be satisfied necessarily with just the walk. You will have added gains with more exercise and you won't need to invest as much time in getting your met minute total because if you're a runner, you don't need nearly as many minutes than if you're a slow walker to get to 750. Got it. Great. Okay. Um, is light running or short bursts of fast running mixed in with walking a good exercise cardio strategy? Excellent question. So this comes to the whole notion of how much exercise and how do we actually exercise? So now, what's great about this question is I've converted you from sitting to now refining around the edges of the type of exercise we do. How come which is everyone awesome. in this room isn't standing right now, David? I feel like we're like outnumbered by, hey, by sitters. You I think and I, I stand up. You and I are standing. So stand that's up. Great. Actually, can we ask like people out there to stand too? Everyone's going to stand. Let's just stand for a few minutes. We have about five minutes left. Let's do it. So um, we should actually be moving here, okay. so, but I'm not going to get into we're, that. We're so burning 2.3 mets per you're right. kilogram per you're hour. Right. Exactly. 160 <laughs> calories per hour by just standing. Um, okay, so there is a growing amount of literature, but it is controversial as to whether high intensity interval training is better than just continuous moderate to vigorous mm. exercise. I do hate training. That's great. I don't. I actually just do moderate to vigorous. She's healthier than I am, clearly. But I mean, I think the bottom line is that there is accumulated evidence that kind of this notion of a walk run or a walk jog or this interval training where you're doing so intensively for a period of time, then going back to sort of a, a, a slower pace and then going extreme does improve our fitness level. What we have to be careful of is that people who do have disease have to be very careful. It has to be scaled very, very carefully with their disease. For example, some people do have heart disease where high interval training does need medical supervision. And that's one of the things that we do do in, that, in our exercise clinics is two things. One, if people do want to do high interval training, you don't go right at it. You have to scale at that. You have to be trained accordingly. The second thing that people don't realize is that often a lot of their activities of higher intensity is actually doing so at a far higher met level than their fitness is actually trained to. So the point being that if I do believe in high interval training, I do believe in making sure that if you do have disease, it's done under some sort of medical supervision, whether it's cardiac rehab or exercise clinics. And the important thing is, is to actually get your conditioning up to a point that you're still able to exercise without an inability to speak a sentence. And if, you're st if you can't speak a sentence while you're exercising, you're doing too much. Great. Okay, I have, uh, I have a question. Like person, I have the person's name too. Should I sh give a shout out to this person? I guess I, su I suppose I should. This is from Karen Henderson. Thank you, Karen, for the question. How does your, uh, excuse me, how does your resting heart rate correlate to your fitness level? Great question, great question. So you remember that little diagram I showed where the fitter we are, the more we extract oxygen and the less the work of the heart has to be? Has anyone ever known or taken a pulse of somebody who is actually highly trained? Yes. What is it? Very I, was, I was an athlete, so it was like lower than 50, resting heart rate in the morning. Very slow. Yeah. Why is it so slow? because we've got all these other mechanisms to extract oxygen. We don't have to worry about the heart. And also all of those endorphins and neurohumoral regulatory hormones that actually make us feel better, slow down our heart rate. So resting heart rate is a good sort of quasi sort of good measure of fitness. It's not, ide it's not ideal because there's other reasons why people's heart rate and pulses can be low thyroid conditions and other heart disease, but it does generally correspond to fitness, particularly in so healthy So an add-on to Karen's question. I, I mentioned I used to years and years and years ago, I uh, used to take my pulse in the morning. Uh, is, what is the best time to take your resting heart rate? Oh, I think any time you're at, at a resting state okay. should be uh, adequate. Um, and your heart rates normally will go down slower in early morning hours between midnight and 6 a.m. That's when our 
parasympathetic, the opposite of the fight and flight response in our hormones, is most active. So if we actually measure your heart rate while you're sleeping, it'll go way down. So you're not going to do that. So during the daytime, it's generally uh, going to be a good representation. And tracking it over a period of time, beneficial? So you actually see progress one way or the other? I'd rather you track your minutes of exercise. There you go. Okay, good question. Um, uh, we did have another question come in. Um, this is an interesting one. What if uh, someone has a mobility issue? Say, I don't know, um, they're in a wheelchair or they just have some uh, kind of um, issues kind of moving around. What, what should they do? Yeah, that's an excellent question, particularly one that's germane to us at mm -hmm. Toronto Rehab where yeah. we do a lot of attentiveness to feed people with spinal cord injuries yes. and whatnot. So the MET can be accumulated in different ways. This is an arm ergometer. Well, this is just motion, but there's different ex ergometers. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason why we can't actually generate METs this way. And with, with intensity and with speed, we can generate the METs uh, on our upper body. So that's number one. There are, the, the METs are not confined uh, to, to just actually walking. Perhaps the best physical activity we can do in the north of 50 range, which by the way I am as well. I'm not telling. Is as we get our aches and pains <laughs> in our knees and hips is swimming, aqua. There is no better probably modality of, of exercise to actually keep us, keep us moving around with some resistance than aqua because we don't actually put our tension and gravity on our knees as much. So there's a host of things we can do. And then finally, building up upper resistance strength is also very, and lower resistance, is also the resistance aspect of strength training is a component to improving our fitness as well. So um, I think Oh, maybe another one. We'll see. We'll see. We still have questions flowing in, which is great. Thank you uh, for for participating and, and really uh, some really terrific uh, information you're looking for. So here's a question. Uh, didn't say who it was from, uh, but it says, "Is there anything on the market that helps circulation while driving?" Oh, this is from. <laughs> I'm not going to say who it's from, uh, but yes, circulation while driving because we know that if you're not moving around, uh, the fluid pools in your legs, and that can lead to all kinds of things, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, sleep apnea. So uh, yes, driving. Driving and circulation. Um, okay. I mean, getting back to the main message here, I, I mean, not that I'm aware of. In other words, there's probably things that will improve kind of flow and kind of improve our, uh, our, our things that are still in development, perhaps with driving. but. You know, don't let our lifestyle get in the way of our health. You know, and my message to commercial truck drivers or to everyday drivers is the same. You know, 150 minutes of the old conventional exercise is test proven. It's test proven, it's irrefutable, and it's simple. Stick to the message and you'll be good. Great. And you know what? Take a break from driving. Don't go like 15 hours straight, right? Absolutely. Come on. That's probably healthy too. <laughs> Okay, so I think, uh, I think that's it for now, uh, but if you have more questions, like keep sending them in and we'll get back to you for sure, either um, over the telephone or by email. Um, you know, since we're talking about fitness uh, and prevention, really, it's, it's a, about a long life and a quality life, um, Toronto Rehab has really pushed this prevention platform. A lot of the research that we're doing, a lot of the promotion and outreach is on prevention. Uh, we want ourselves and our families and our friends and colleagues and so on and all of you uh, to live uh, the most beautiful life, a life that's long and fulfilling. On that note, we have uh, a few things that we're doing this fall, Toronto Rehab and Toronto Rehab Foundation, and it, it's in line uh, with your talk today. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a shout out. Uh, we have two fairly significant events. Uh, first is the Scotiabank Marathon. And I know we're talking, you know, 750 mats and moderate exercise, but Scotiabank is brilliant. They uh, actually have many distances and they have a five kilometer walk. And, and quite frankly, Toronto Rehab has one of the largest contingents at Scotiabank Marathon. So uh, we'll send some information out about that. And we also have uh, one of the biggest events in the city uh, with respect to fitness and it's called the Rocket Ride for Rehab, which is a static spin event that we do in Nathan Phillips Square. So uh, we encourage you uh, to come out and join us and uh, you know, help us help you get, get even more fit. Uh, 
And I think on that note, was there anything else you wanted to add, David? No, uh, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a fun topic and it's, a, it's one that is really uh, pertinent in, in, in terms of the 5K runs or walks. Walks. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's great and it's great to actually build to momentum towards those goals. So, uh, you know, I've done it and continue to do it and it's a lot of fun. And to your point, that whole idea of goal setting and giving yourself a target, whether it's fitness, whether it's walking, running, swimming, weight, 750 mats, those goals kind of inspire one yep. to move forward and actually try to achieve them over time. David, absolutely a privilege having you join us today. Thank, Thank you. you so it's much. You're always entertaining and so informative. Thanks so, so much for thanks having Thanks again. Me. Enjoy the day. It's beautiful and blue out there. Go for a walk. Yeah, okay. thanks. thanks. Thank you.